Hey, happy Friday. This week we got a whole new type of RAM. The US government announced new limitations on Huawei in just the weirdest way possible, and OpenAI and Microsoft seem to be decoupling a little bit. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. We're starting to brief this week with the president of Nintendo casually confirming in a tweet that they will launch the successor to the Nintendo Switch within this fiscal year. That is a weirdly low-key way to announce a key product, but either way, no further information is available. My guess is that we'll see a launch for this in full, so it will be just in time for the holidays. Next, Matter, the interactive IoT standard, got a major update to version 1.3, which means it now also supports ovens and cooktops, energy and water management, and even EV chargers. Now, if only companies really adopted this, it could become a proper standard across the industry. Moving on to unexpected news, a Twitter user named Albacore found that Windows 11 preview build quietly added the ability to show widgets right in the start menu. These seem to be basically replacements for live tiles, and fun fact, my next tech altar video will be about why these guys have failed. Anyway, also this week, both YouTube and Amazon Prime have announced that they are excited to show you so-called pause screen ads. You know, so you can conveniently browse Amazon products as soon as you hit pause. Clearly, you hit pause to stop the show and not the ads, so according to them, that is somehow totally fine. Anyway, talking about ads, Apple's latest ad showing creative objects being crushed down into an iPad not only got people so mad that the company came out and had to offer a rare apology saying that they missed the mark, but as it turns out, the ad was basically also a complete ripoff of a random LG ad from like 15 years ago. I personally didn't think that the ad was that bad, but yeah, this is a weird misstep from a company that's usually just extremely well controlled. Okay, and talking of iPads, our release monitor starts with the brand new iPad Air and Pro models. And the most surprising thing about this announcement, at least to me, is that the Pro models now feature a brand new M4 chip. This came just half a year after the M3 was announced, which itself came just half a year behind the M2, so Apple is really ramping up the release cadence like crazy here. And while the company was as confusing as ever about their own performance metrics, a bunch of benchmarks have since leaked, of course, saying that there is a 25% increase in single-core CPU performance, and the GPU performance is up 22% as well, so it's not like the performance is lacking either. And if those leaks are true, the M4 would likely beat Snapdragon's upcoming X Elite chip on almost all of the metrics, even if only by a little bit. It's kind of funny to me how Qualcomm very confidently and happily announced the X Elite as a sort of M2 killer last year, and then Apple went on and dropped like two generations of chips before they ever came to market with it. Pretty badass. Anyway, beside the new chips, the iPads also have tandem OLED screens, just like the latest Huawei and Honor phones, which means that they are stacking two OLED layers on top of each other for extra brightness and better longevity, and they also come with new pencils, which support hovering, squeezing the pencil, and barrel rolling it due to a little gyroscope inside and more. That looks very cool for people who, unlike me, can actually draw, but it also means that you now have a very un-Apple-like pencil feature matrix to consider before making your next purchase. Steve Jobs is rolling in his grave and screaming like, damn you, Tim Apple, simplify that portfolio. <laughs> And moving on, Google also announced the Pixel 8a this week, which is exactly what the name sounds like. A slightly cheaper model for $549 with more mid-range specs. It seems like a pretty good phone, but its biggest problem perhaps is that you can get a regular Pixel 8 for just $50 extra. Well, well. Now, also this week, Asus kind of half announced the ROG Li X in a weird live stream with very few details. We know that we should expect a minor refresh of sorts with the same chip and the same display, but a much bigger battery with some design tweaks and not much more. Oh well. And finally, in our release monitor, you're not looking at an Apple Watch, but rather the brand new Huawei Watch Fit 3. I bet you didn't see that coming, especially when even the animations look extremely, well, Apple-inspired, I guess. I mean, the functionality seems pretty good, and the 160 euro price tag is also pretty good, but the fact that stylish design is somehow the first thing that they highlight in their own ad about it is, uh, I guess, just pretty bold. Anyway, for my first story of the week, there's kind of a revolution happening in the laptop market under our noses, and it's all about RAM. So the news is that so-called low-power, compression-attached memory modules, or LPCAM2, are now available in real laptops. These are a new type of RAM module that will hopefully replace the existing 25-year-old standard called SODIM, and they're actually a pretty big deal. 
the sodium connection ends up wasting a lot of power, which is part of why a lot of laptop makers end up basically soldering on their RAM right onto the motherboard. And it's also one of the reasons why Apple has famously skipped the whole classic RAM setup by moving the memory straight onto the M series SOC to make memory even more integrated. This means that Mac, Windows, and Linux laptops have all become much less repairable and upgradable over time, but with LP Cam 2, which is how I choose to pronounce it, we seem to have a real promising solution. The new module sits much closer to the CPU and is generally more efficient, which allows for space savings of about 64%, but it's also 58% more energy efficient and 30% faster than existing sodium memory, at least according to Micron. And meanwhile, Samsung is perhaps even more optimistic, quoting 60% less operating power and 72% less standby power. Is this as efficient as Apple's built-in memory? I suppose not, but it's definitely way closer than so dim. And as iFixit has shown in their excellent video that I've linked to down below, it's still easily user upgradable and repairable with just a few screws. Now, fun fact, Dell originally kickstarted this process with something called CAM back then, but their solution was quite different from what we ended up on today. And now Samsung and Micron both have real memory sticks built with the technology, which you can buy starting from 175 bucks from what I can tell. And the new Lenovo P1 workstation is the first real laptop that ships with this technology. You can supposedly go up to 128 gigs with the current version of the technology, which should be plenty. And now the next question is when the laptop makers will actually include this in their machines. Fingers crossed it's actually pretty soon. Okay, and for my second story of the week, the United States government is rolling out perhaps its most confusing chip limitations on Huawei yet. Reuters first reported that the US has revoked Intel and Qualcomm's export licenses to sell to Huawei effective immediately, and then the Department of Commerce then confirmed this, but didn't reveal more details. The new limits come just days after a bunch of new Matebook laptops came to international markets running Intel's core ultra chips, so that might or might not be related. Now, we know that the ban doesn't actually cover all Intel and Qualcomm chips, only some of them, and Intel has explicitly said that only, quote, consumer-related items, so probably laptop chips, are blocked, but data center ones are not. Looking through Huawei's own documentation, I can see that the company's cloud business uses tons of Intel Xeon server chips, and those are presumably not blocked by the new deal. And the more I read here, the more baffling this decision becomes to me. Like, if Huawei is a security threat, why block their laptop chips instead of their data center chips? Huawei is China's second biggest cloud provider with massive data centers across the world as well, which is surely a bigger security challenge than them selling box standard Windows laptops, especially given that Huawei only has about a 2% market share in PCs worldwide and has been stuck as a relatively minor player in this field for many years now. And if starving Huawei's phone business of chips was somehow the objective, why did the US let them use Qualcomm chips right until after Huawei developed its own chips and figured out its manufacturing in China? The company now has domestically produced chips in most of their new flagship phones and even across their mid-range models. It's kind of a bit too late now. Like either Huawei is a security threat, in which case block them completely, or it's not, in which case don't block them halfway because that's just gonna make them completely self-reliant eventually. Like Qualcomm doesn't even list Huawei as a top 10 customer anymore, so a ban like this is basically pointless at this time anyway. Anyway, moving on. My third story of the week is that Microsoft and OpenAI seem to be decoupling their AI efforts quite a bit. On the one hand, the information reports that Microsoft is developing MAI-1, its own massive large language model. With about 500 billion parameters, it's expected to be slightly weaker than GPT-4, but regardless of that, it would of course also place Microsoft in direct competition with OpenAI, its biggest AI partner to date. We've seen Microsoft invest into the French OpenAI rival Mistral in the past as well, and now with their own large language model in the works, it's clear that Microsoft wants to have at least a backup plan for if things go south with OpenAI, like they almost did a couple of months ago. But OpenAI doesn't seem to be happy to just sit on their laurels either. First, a powerful new version of GPT seems to have appeared, then vanished, and then kind of appeared again, which people presume might be GPT-5 launching soon. But even more interestingly, the company is also readying a search engine of its own, according to a report from Bloomberg. They are apparently aggressively trying to poach Google employees for a team that is working hard to ship the product soon, which confirms earlier rumors of a dedicated OpenAI search engine. ChatGPT has until now relied on search data from Bing for its web information, and in fact having it built into Bing was one of the things that was supposed to help Microsoft's search engine take off too, but it seems clear that OpenAI thinks it might be able to do a better job on its own. Now, of course, it's too early to say where any of this will go, but it kind of looks like a competition now. 
AI is becoming so crucial to these companies that they'd easily spend a couple of billion dollars as basically a contingency plan. And if this is a field that you would like to get in on yourself, maybe you'd like to work in AI, then you should probably learn how large language models actually work. Luckily, Brilliant has an amazing course breaking down exactly how large language models work. And like with any course on their platform, they do this by breaking down the topic into bite-sized chunks, after each of which you'll be asked to do custom interactive exercises for practice. This way you can make sure that you actually understand what you're learning at a deep fundamental level, instead of just flicking through a book or watching a video passively. And these interactive examples make sure that your learnings then also stick with you for much longer. Brilliant is a fantastic online platform for learning STEM skills which covers topics from maths to physics, engineering, biology, computer science, and more. The classes are actually fun, and the learning paths start from really basic concepts, like the Introduction to Algorithms course, and then take you all the way to advanced ones, like quantum computing, or how large language models work, and more. This is a fantastic resource for those who want to progress in their career, or for those who just want to learn something new. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, you can go to brilliant.org slash TFC that is also linked down in the description. And then if you choose to get an annual plan, you can get 20% off a premium subscription. So check them out. Happy learning. And I'll see you next Friday.